connection with each other's lives. So I do want to share a little bit more background and context around who I am and how I became a researcher, professor, scholar around issues in boys' education, and then follow your essential framework that you provided for us, Tavici, in terms of thinking about what are some methodological approaches that are kind of salient in this moment around supporting boys and men in the world, and then also what are some research trends that we are noticing as well. So I'll say that I am currently an associate professor in the Department of Educational Studies at Swarthmore College, and I'm also affiliated with the Gender and Sexuality Studies program. And I identify as a sociologist of education by training, and my kind of two core areas of interest are race, boyhood, and education, and identity, culture, and school reform. And I began my career in education as a first grade teacher on the north side of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is where I grew up. And it's one of the poorest and racially segregated neighborhoods for African American families in the country. And it was at a co-ed elementary school that had a single sex intervention by default for a group of primarily black and Latinx boys. So my principal at the time had asked all of the kindergarten teachers to identify students that they thought could benefit from an early intervention around their academic performance or their behavior. And by default, that group came back a list of boys. And then I was assigned as their teacher. And <laughs> one thing I learned very quickly in my role as a classroom teacher of them is just before it became known that I would be their classroom teachers or their classroom teacher, all of these narratives were shared with me about the boys that I was going to inherit. And, <laughs> you know, this one will always be out of its seat. This one can't keep his hands to himself. This one, you know, don't give a pencil to. <laughs> so all these narratives about the boys that I was going to inherit and all coming from a well-meaning place you know, in an effort to support my success with teaching these boys. But as you can see from just that short list of vignettes about the boys in particular, there were narratives that were rooted in these narrow race and gender stereotypes around black boys and men of color in the world. And, you know, being a first year novice teacher, clumsily in hindsight, relationships with the boys became a window into their reimagining. And I, I quickly learned <laughs> that they were so much more than or the yeah. furthest thing okay. from <laughs> And the nerves that appeared with me about them. And many of them were actually high performing, but just disengaged from the kind of lackluster instruction of rote memorization, drill, and skill that was taking place in their kindergarten classrooms. So, you know, leading with seeking to understand their perspectives, you know, to understand their world and experiences led me to have an understanding of them that helped me be their classroom teacher. You know, and these were boys too that came from the same neighborhood and community that I grew up in. The elementary school was right across the street from a housing project where I also grew up. So this was a, a community that was near and dear to me. And so now when I think about, you know, what how teachers and other educators need to be supported around teaching, you know, boys in particular is bringing some intentionality to relationship building. So if learning is the goal, then we need to bring some intentionality to relationship building because it's through those relationships that their, their understanding and view of who they are is quickly changed. But we have to be intentional when we're navigating these differences around race and gender and class. So I just wanted to give you that little bit of setup in terms of how I come to my own research in boys' education. And so I guess thinking methodologically, about what I'm noticing in the field of boys education, boys learning and development, is that there's more kind of focus on asking boys who they are and what they think and what they desire and value in their lives as children and children worthy of a childhood. So just the, the stance of valuing children's perspectives and asking them about their experiences and their perspectives from their own views and as much as maybe that is familiar and commonsensical to us in this space, <laughs> in the more traditional kind of universe of educational research, that's not always the case, where we sometimes see children's perspective as frivolous, as not valuable, as nonsense. <laughs> but you know, our stance in and or belief that I'm I'm noticing methodologically is that we we position children as as individuals that can teach us about our world and actually have held on to a lot of, of who we are as humans <laughs> and haven't grown up enough to have all of our kind of human capacities kind of subtracted from them. Oftentimes, which is what happens in our, 
our school systems. So, you know, asking boys who they are, what they think, what they desire, valuing children's perspectives. And also acknowledging that historically marginalized groups of boys within our society also have something to teach us about childhood. You know, because a lot of historically our child development models were not diverse in, you know, asking children about their experiences. So in many ways, you know, children of color, boys of color were seen as an aberration from the norm. <laughs> but actually our, our, our child developmental models actually stand to be more, more robust if we kind of complicate them with the experiences of diverse groups of children. And I see in education now a lot of the way we go about diagnosis students with special needs, you know, or, you know, special education referral processes, all of those instruments were developed based on measures that didn't account for the diversity of our childhood population. So, you know, we're quick to label and categorize and sort and emphasize quarantine and control and discipline rather than teaching and learning and development when our instruments um, don't account for the diversity of the world that we live in. And then lastly, what I'll say about methods or methodologically speaking is that we're seeing more research that are going where children are, <laughs> where they go and live their everyday lives. So in schools and classrooms and neighborhoods and communities and, and, and family centers, preschools, these other settings where children live their lives and kind of expect, ex asking them about their worlds where they live them out. And again, you know, to us in this community, this space may make a lot of sense, but there's still um, kind of a, an emphasis in educational research to bring children to contrived spaces <laughs> and observe them under cameras, <laughs> engaging in certain types of activities to then lend to our understanding of how they're experiencing the world but actually going to where they live their lives, we stand to learn so much more from them when we're out in the natural settings where they live and where they be. So that's methodologically speaking. And then quickly what I'll share around just research trends that I'm noticing is that, you know, with gender socialization in particular with boys is that we're seeing that more conducted in relation to racial socialization or racial identity development. So gender socialization alongside race, so that it's the intersection of race and gender and class and taking more intersectional approaches, which is um, more challenging scholarship to conduct. It is an investment of time to do it well, but it's what we need in this moment so that we, we, we l learn something new. <laughs> You know, that the folks who study race and the folks who study gender or the folks who study class all come together to wrestle with <laughs> the world that we live in to, you know, gain more deeper understandings of it. And then with other things that we are starting to notice in terms of the research and accounting for things is gender diversity. So gender socialization being looked at at the specific experiences of LGBTQIA plus boys or trans and non-binary children. So gender socialization at the intersection of gender diversity. And then lastly, we are starting to kind of conduct more studies that look at the specificity experiences around particular racial and ethnic groups of boys. And that's seen as an, um, their specificity of experience does still contribute to our understanding of children and that specificity matters <laughs> and we need to gain more clarity around it because we stand to learn how to build more supports that accounts for their specific experiences that are connected to their race and ethnic identities so i will pause there those are my kind of general thoughts again around what I'm noticing methodologically and research trends and how my own background kind of shapes those insights. So thank you. I look forward to the conversation. That was just incredibly invigorating and just so um, so thoughtful, Joseph, and, and such an incredible trajectory that you've had and how you sort of saw those patterns in your life, even as a teacher. So um, incredible. I. Yeah, I would, I would love to just open it up and see if people had some questions about their work, um, Joseph, what, Joseph's work, you know, sharing their, your own kind of existing insights around what we're doing right now. 
uh, do you see some parallels? Um, and then I'll, I'll ask my question in the end. So I'll take a minute to see if anybody else has anything they wanna ask. And you can put it in the chat as well if you don't wanna ask. Joseph, I, I want to thank you for that frame. And, and you know, I, I um, think about the work that we try to impact. And there's that, that concept of intentionality of relationship building, right? <clears throat> that, um, that has always existed with young children. It always has existed with young children. It just has never leaned in and benefited uh, Black young boys or, or Latino, Latina, Latinx children, right? Well, I, I should say Latina. I think there's uh, in, within our our ethnicity and culture, uh, the performance of Latinas in education really is a is a stark reminder that it's only certain type of of profiles that um, that teachers and administrators uh, favor. And I won't say it's where it needs to be, but within culture, that's what it is. And um, I've heard educators say, "I'm here to teach." Uh, not to construct relationships. And uh, when they do say that, um, I, I always know that they're in fact not educators. They're, uh, they're part of a warehouse system and you get, uh, you can't expect much from that. So thank you so much. I'm gonna um, be sharing this content with our training team who's, who will say, wow, there's people studying this concept and I know they maybe have already found it, but it will help. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Of course, of course, my pleasure. And what I'll add too is, you know, teachers internalize these narrative images about who their, you know, Black and Latinx boys are. And one of those stereotypes is that they're a-relational, that they, they, they don't value relationships or they don't want a close relationship with their teacher and they want to be independent and figure it out on their own. But I've heard overwhelmingly from all of the, the conversations that I've had with boys through my own research is that they too want those close relationships with their teachers and that they value them and see them as important to their success. And, and in those relationships, they feel very much so seen by teachers who value it. And then that you know, gives them a sense of themselves that allows them to you know, be who they fully are and not feel like they have to subscribe to or internalize these, you know, stereotypes or narratives that are being imposed on them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of pushing against, you know, those stereotypes that often it, 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 that mediate how teachers interact with their boys. Gary has a question. Hey, Joseph, first, thanks for that. Um, a couple of maybe a comment and then a, and then a question the I mean, it's an exciting moment in our field, your field, that um, both UNESCO and the World Bank have are coming out with reports or just came out with reports looking at the data showing that at 140 countries around the world, boys are faring worse in education compared to girls. Um, and I think there's a lot of discussion in UN agencies, World Banks, and I'm not sure if it's made it into education systems as much, around what to do about that. And you know, the, the challenge, of course, is to how to keep that intersectional lens that you're bringing to it. In most countries, it is low-income boys, but not always. We're seeing in university enrollment, even among middle class, that boys are, young men are not um, enrolled as much in university. That's a middle-class phenomenon, as, and of course, even worse among lower income and disadvantaged groups. And so I guess the, so one is to say, how do we think together of how to amplify the voice of your research in those spaces and would love to, to find ways to connect you up in those conversations? Because I think lots of ministries of education are going to step in to say, what do we do? Um, so just to say, we'd love to stay connected on that. And then on that segue to say, yeah, the what do we do? Um, what kinds of, you know, what are the, what are the practices you talked about, you know, obviously relationships and intentionality, awareness of the nuances around the research approaches we need here. But yeah, I guess, you know, to prime ourselves for um, when we get, you know, some folks at the World Bank or Ministry of Education in country X where we partner, um, and this may, you know, may take a longer, <laughs> longer response, but the, you know, what do we do? Um, what is good educational policy that brings in 
this intersectional lens um, that's, you know, gender, class, race, um, and well, and sexual diversity, as you also thoughtfully brought in as well. Um, so let me stop there and love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure, sure. So what I've, so being a, a sociologist, we're trying to think very institutionally, <laughs> like, you know, so what are the policies and practices and traditions that are shaping an institutional context? And so then thinking about the distinct experiences of boys of color, what are the policies, practices, or traditions that are inflicting the most harm? <laughs> so, you know, the, the research clearly shows to us that um, school discipline policy, special education referral processes, and teacher expectations are the, like the three factors that are contributing to the most in terms of our trends around, you know, Black and Latinx boys in education. So they're adverse social and academic outcomes. And so then, you know, where I see the next step we should be going in is thinking about how do we reform <laughs> our school discipline policies? How do we revisit our special education referral processes? And how do we kind of, you know, help teachers uproot their expectations of their groups of boys? And I think if, if we kind of channel our energies towards reforming those kind of three core dimensions of education or ministries of education, kind of work through kind of how to reimagine these aspects of school life, I think we stand to see the greatest amount of change. And it's these areas come out of, you know, the, the intersectional experiences of boys. So, you know, I always point to those three areas of where we can channel our work, where we have high lever, the potential for high lever change. But then maybe more at the classroom level with around building relationships, you know, I go back to kind of relational teaching, which is kind of an extension of Michael Reichert's work, who's a, a ProMondo board member as well. And, you know, he and I together, you know, conducted a study that asked teachers and boys about, tell me about a relationship with the teacher that was successful, tell me about one that was challenging. And it was looking across the narratives from both boys and their teachers that we came up with or able to identify a core set of relational teaching strategies that becomes what teachers can explicitly do in their classrooms. And it's not, um, you know, all tied to our, our, our social and relational nature as human beings, <laughs> you know, establishing common ground, finding common interests so that teachers can see themselves in their boys and boys can see themselves in their teachers. It's reaching out, going beyond. So not being preoccupied with adhering to a school policy if it, if it gets in the way of meeting a boy's distinct learning need. <laughs> that actually, you know, reaching out, going beyond is seeing a boy's personhood and their learning needs as more important than your commitment to adhering a school policy. You know, granted, yes, there are some policies that are important to adhere to, but not an over-reliance and an over-commitment. And then I'd say another example is um, what do we call oh, personal advocacy. So our most difficult boys, so to speak, the ones who maybe have internalized all the negative stereotypes around who it is to be a boy of color in our world. Usually, you know, boys who internalize those are ones that are the most um, vulnerable. Usually the, they're the ones that are, are, are struggling in many ways, academically, social, emotionally. So then how can we be intentional about, about supporting their success in our classroom? And it just means to build a relationship with them, finding places in their lives where they're experiencing success. <laughs> maybe it's in theater, maybe it's in music or dance, maybe it's you know playing drums at their church or some aspect of their life where they're experiencing success and going where they are and, and, and seeing them shine in that context but then using that knowledge about them and where they're experiencing that success to re-engage them in the learning in your classroom or to support the success in their classroom. So I always tell you know, school district leaders, look at school discipline, look at special education and look at teacher expectations. And then with relationships at the classroom teacher level, it's here's some strategies that you can use that then they'll quickly see, you know, there, I'm always struck by how teachers overwhelmingly say, I didn't know that about him, <laughs> or I had no idea that he had that interest. <laughs> so, and it's just asking a question that then they respond to that you learned something that you didn't know before. And he immediately becomes something that you can use to engage their learning in your class. So thank you for your question. 
year. I think just on that, there's another question um, from uh, Joseph Wes, and then Hector has his hand up as well. But what do you see some as some of the barriers to teachers developing these relationships? Is it lack of understanding of the need, fear of youth of color, too much emphasis on standardized tests? You kind of touched upon it right now, but um, just a little bit more uh, specific. And then Hector after that. Please. Yes, yes. It's you know, it's the it's the one that isn't always as like neat and tidy to address, <laughs> but it's teacher expectations. You know, so much of teachers' professional decision making are rooted in their expectations and perceptions of their students, and that's harder work to do. And it's more long term work. It requires them to kind of be an honest reckoning with themselves about the narrative that they've internalized about their their students and being um you know clear-minded about how they want to respond or build in practices in their classrooms that counter you know their kind of biases and assumptions that they may carry into their role as a classroom teachers about their their boys and I frame it as it can't, you know, it can be some independent reflection, but it also requires a kind of critical peer group, other colleagues, other administrators that they talk to about their relationships with their boys. I had this exchange with this student yesterday. Here's what here's what happened. Here's what I did. Here's how the boys responded and vice versa. And what can I do differently going forward? Hmm. It's in those kind of building in those daily practices that that support you in making better and better pedagogical decisions about how to support your boys that support their success. And you know, it's the teacher expectation part that isn't as kind of like um, concrete to hang on to, but it's where the root is. And it's kind of that dispositions work we call in teacher education where how they view their classroom, how they view their students matters. My comment was a little bit more uh, actually to, to uh, Gary's uh, response. And I just want us to be really cognizant when we talk about, for example, the decline of middle class, what that's a euphemism for is white young men. And if you speak to professors, you will hear that not all white young men that are in college have really earned that right. It was more of a privilege of, of resources and, um, and that only comes up historically when slots are removed. So when women were afforded a, a greater opportunity to call, attend college, it was that seen as the expense of white young men, right? When in California, when you look at the, the, the way that you earn your way into an elite university, it's always, uh, when it's a diverse population, it's always framed as in a relation to a loss for, for young men. That's the historic privilege that they own those positions, that they own those slots. Uh, and so that meritocracy argument you know, that they argue for is undermined by the practice of how they want to affect it. So I'm not saying that we shouldn't look critically at what, what is causing that. But when we frame it as a problem, we should be very careful that we're not perpetuating the privilege that those slots belong to white young men, right? And that anybody that, uh, that competes to get into a university, uh, it's, it's taking a slot from them. They don't own those slots. Uh, and so uh, when we say uh, that it's an issue to be examined, we must be very careful that we aren't simply saying somebody it's this is all being done at the expense of white middle class young men uh, because some probably uh, many of them deserve to be there but if you speak to professors that have been in the field for 30 years they say not all of those young men historically were destined for college it was an expectation of family and resources that backed them up and so i just want to say that because uh, we can easily slip into that um, view and I know Michael will have a different view than me and I'll, and I'll share my perspective with him as well. Uh, those slots belong to society and, and everybody in society and we should be looking at how it is that everybody that's looking for that opportunity of education from kindergarten all the way to a university that we support 
and guide that. There are universities there for everybody, but I would hate for us to say that the reason why this is important is because fewer white young men are, are not going to college. We never had that about Latino kids, uh, Latino boys, black young men. It's only now, right? And so, and I know that there's a narrative that goes with that about suitability of partners for young. I mean, it's all based on heterosexual bias, right? Uh, male privilege. I'll, I'll be quiet and listen now. Thank you, uh, Hector, and thank you, um, everybody, for your incredible comments. And Joseph, there's a desire from Wayne that if you would want to share your links to your research, um, oh, I sure. think just like Gary said, yeah, we would love to also amplify your work. And um, I think for all of us as, as staff at Pumundo, we would also be just so um, lucky to be able to read some of the key pieces that you think would help us in our work as we move forward. Um, so we are doing really well on time. Um, if there's nothing else at the moment, I would like to um, uh, ask Judy uh, to do her little talk right now, not little big talk, but uh, her talk right now. But um, if there's other questions for Joseph, please keep putting it in the chat because I'm, I'm watching this chat. So I'll, I'll bring it up again. So um, Judy, over to you and, and looking forward. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I wish we could continue on the, you know, with this discussion because I think that Joseph's presentation really launched some, you know, introduced a lot of very important issues to consider. And I hope that I can tie it into what I'm saying as well because my, my work definitely um, overlaps and coincides and piggybacks on everything that Joseph has said. We come from a very similar approach to studying boys. Um, as, as Tavishi and Joseph mentioned, you know, we've, we've all worked with Niobe and um, like Niobe, I also trained with Carol Gilligan and a lot of the relational theory and the relational method um, really uh, found a, uh, are based and rooted in, in that work. And so, um, a, I have slides to share, but given that um, this is more of a conversation, I don't need to use them. Um, it's just that the slides include some uh, references and I'm happy to share those afterwards if anybody would be interested. Um, but as, as Joseph mentioned, this, this idea of a relational theory really emphasizes the fact that you know, all humans, you know, regardless of gender, regardless of any other demographic background factors, really you know, um, develop live their lives, their experiences are inextricably embedded within interpersonal relationships as well as their social and cultural context. And so it starts from that place. And the reason to even make that explicit is because as Joseph pointed out, the history of the study of human development psychology did not always recognize that. You know, it was kind of this illusion of, oh, you know, there's individuals and if you can have relationships, that's nice, but it was almost like an optional thing. Like, oh yeah, relationships are helpful, but you know, it's really about the individual moving, you know, developing and maturing towards individuation and separation and society really associating, you know, the ability to be individuals, autonomous and separate from it, not needing anyone as markers of maturity and for boys and men, markers of manhood. And so it's again, you know, with this context, that kind of boys gender socialization came to be or continues to be like this idea that we need to move people away from the nurturance and the relationships and the intimacies that are hallmarks of you know infancy and early childhood and as they grow up we need to help them stand alone and not need anyone and so and very much so more of a push for boys and men to do that because of the way that patriarchal constructions of gender have defined masculinity for boys and men, but also, you know, to some extent for, for girls and women, or at least girls and women be, and, and, and uh, um, folks who don't identify as males being regarded as somehow lesser than because they admit their reliance on relationships, because relationships are so central to the way that they view themselves and construct their values. Um, so really coming from a relational model and framework, um, for those who of you who might not be familiar, but I'm assuming everyone here is. Um, and the other thing that Joseph really highlighted well is you know, the, the use of a voice-centered relational method, which I, um, I always loved how Carol described it as starting from a place of not knowing. So like if you were visiting a new place and you're, you're traveling and you're, or you're just, you know, in a new community or just with people you've never met. So any, any new situation where you have a genuine, um, desire to learn, a genuine curiosity about, you know, what life is like for the, for the person you're trying to get to know, starting from this, you know, place of humility and really, you know, as Joseph used these words, you know, really trying to understand their experiences 
in their words, from their perspectives, on their terms, in this most respectful way possible, so as to invite them to share with you not only the stories that you know to ask about, but the stories that they feel are, are important to them that you might not from your own training think to ask about. And so it's, it really opens up the doors of possibility much more because, you know, absolutely, you know, as a researcher, you go in with certain ideas about what you think you want to learn about, but it's all the better when the participants in your study feel um, empowered enough to say, oh, wait, you forgot to ask about this. And this is really important to me or my family or my community. So to, to really create that space to learn something new in the situation is kind of at the heart of a voice-centered relational method. And it definitely um, recognizes that there are power dynamics in who gets to ask the questions and who gets to share, but it really tries to um, kind of not compensate, but try to level things out a bit by saying, you know, when I went in to talk to these four-year-old boys, I really looked to them as my teachers and I would tell them, you know, I don't know what it's like to be a four-year-old boy. I'm really interested to find out what it's like for you. And lucky for me, they said, oh, okay, in that case, you need to know about this, this, and this, or you need to see this, or you need to come with us to, you know, when we're playing this game and see what's happening. And so, um, and I think it's, uh, the nice thing about it is that anyone can do it because you know kids know or all people know when somebody is genuinely interested. So I always you know tell people it's not like I you know I had some special training and came in and only I can do it. Anyone can do it because kids can tell if you're really interested and they can tell you what they know and what they need. And so I think that that's also always a very very hopeful thing because for all of us in the room, you know who I who I view as helpers. You know, it's so it's it makes our job easier if the people if we can trust that the people who are we are trying to help, you know, don't see us first of all coming in and swooping up and kind of in this heroic fashion, but that we're working alongside them and that we very much want to know what they would find helpful, not just what we intend or you know with best intentions mean to be helpful. So that kind of gives a little bit of a nod to the category of the kind of methods and you know, particularly considerations for working with boys maybe in childhood and um, adolescence. In, uh, in regards to the topic of gender socialization and kind of research trends, I think you know, most of you are very familiar with this, so I'll just say it very succinctly, but you know, my research adds to the literature that says, you know what, <laughs> we've known now for almost four decades that boys' socialization towards these patriarchal norms of masculinity can be harmful, you know, can, you know, can be very socially adaptive when certain, you know, masculine qualities and skills are more valued, especially compared to, say, you know, qualities and skills that are deemed feminine, but that there can be, um, so it's socially adaptive, but they can be psychologically and relationally costly. So this kind of this, you know, there's definitely, there are the reasons why they may be, you know, willing to comply and to conform to the, the, the ideas of masculinity that are prized by our culture, but we are beginning to, well, not we're beginning, we've been recognizing that there's a downside to it as well. And at the very least, we're not trying to say people should make different choices, although we certainly would hope that they would make choices that are, you know, that they deem more positive and healthy for themselves. But what we want to them to do is at least recognize that they're making a choice so that it doesn't become this automatic default to get swept into this current of, oh, this is what it means to grow up. This is what it means to become a man or a real boy and not, and kind of lose sight of their sense of agency, particularly because as my work and Niobe's work and Carol's work, you know, really highlights is this, there is evidence of this really, you know, this healthy resistance against, you know, not necessarily compromise. I think compromise gets a bad rap because we all have to compromise whenever we're doing something with another individual. Nobody gets to have their, you know, the way they want things all the time. But uh, what I call over compromise to the sense where you feel like you don't have a voice in the, in the relationship or in the conversation anymore. We want, you know, they have a healthy resistance also, or, you know, again, to come back to the four-year-old boys against being bossed around, you know, against being told what to do without being asked what they want. And so this is all kind of an instinctive response to imposition. And we want to nurture that healthy response because that is a fight to preserve their sense of integrity. That is a fight to preserve their sense of 
I want to connect with you in a genuine way. And that means sometimes we're going to disagree. Sometimes we're not going to want the same things, but can you stay in relationship with me? Can we continue to have a conversation, even if we don't agree all the time, even if we're not identical? And I think that's something that I really heard the kids kind of trying to figure out, you know, part of childhood and all of growing up actually is figuring out like, how is it possible for me to be in this world and with other people? You know, do I have a place in the world where somebody else can be with me and in, in all that I am, you know, imperfections and all. And so they really want to know, you know, how, how, to, how to make sense of everything they're hearing, because they're definitely bombarded with messages daily about what's valued, what's okay. And what I was finding when, it, when I started studying boys, it was with adolescent boys. And what I was hearing was they were narrating this love, this, not this lovely, but <laughs> this process where they were kind of identifying this gap between the way people say boys are and the way they experience themselves to be. And at adolescents, like 12 to 18, even more so with the older boys, they were coming to kind of accept that at least there's this narrative, there's this cultural lesson that says, part of growing up is just accepting that that gap's gonna exist, that people just aren't gonna know you for who you are and you just have to suck it up deal with it and the more you can that that's a demonstration of your maturity. So when I brought these kind of initial impressions to Carol, she said, well, you really need to start earlier. And she said, go to a place where they're still actively, you know, resisting that, like where they're not yet afraid to say, hey, this doesn't sound good to me. I don't like this. And they haven't yet been, you know, been responded to with, oh, well, then you're a mama's boy, or you're a sissy, or you're not a real boy, or whatever. And so she really um, encouraged me to look at the younger boys. And what I um, was lucky enough to witness in my in the study that I write about in my book is that there was this kind of moment of transition, this window into a time when, on one hand, the four-year-old boys, when they were starting to enter schools, they were still kind of wearing their hearts on their sleeves. You know, they would and could tell you exactly what they were thinking and feeling. And they just kind of, there's just this exuberance, this kind of friendliness, this joy in being, but also, you know, very real anger when somebody, you know, treated them unfairly. And so just kind of all the emotions right out in the open. And then watching them over the course of that pre-K year, learn that, oh, you know what? there are these rules for engagement. And a lot of it was, some of it was coming from the teachers, like what they were learning, like what the teachers tended to correct or encourage or value and comment on. Um, but a lot of it was coming from the other boys because they were motivated to even you know, pay attention to these rules by this relational desire to connect. They wanted to identify and relate to the other boys as boys. So they would say, you know, how, you know, if, if the boys are doing this, you know, how can I belong? How can I, and, and unfortunately, one of the things was, well, I belong by fitting in. But as Brene Brown points out, the thing that obstructs belonging is the attempt to fit in because in attempting to fit in, we then begin to kind of cover up or edit, self-edit ourselves in order to please to do and to present ourselves in ways that we think will be pleasing and acceptable to other people. But anyway, I will always like to point out that their motivation comes from a relational place, from their capacity and desire to connect in authentic ways. They are total BS detectors because they don't want something that's even if it's nice, if it's not real, they pick it up and they'll call you on it. And so they really want something real, and they really do come up against this kind of wall when they start to say, you know, when, for instance, they might notice like, oh, you seem really angry. And the, the adult says, oh, no, I'm fine. You know, it's fine. Just keep under that kind of denial of their perception starts to throw things into not necessarily confusion, but this definite understanding that, oh, you know what? I can't always say what I know. So it can make some other people uncomfortable. I need to kind of self-edit a little bit because you know, I, if I want to fit in, if I want to be a part of this, if I want to belong, I need to kind of watch myself. And that, again, like I said, it's socially adaptive. When we, when we enter any new environment, we're trying to figure out what are the rules of this place? How do I not cause a disruption, especially with, you know, a disruption that might lead to negative consequences like ridicule or exclusion, but um, very much kind of navigating that. So what I, um, sorry, I'm good. I could talk about this for years. And so let me, let me chunk it a little bit. So one of the things that I document is this shift in the boy's relational presence. And it's not to say that they were relational and then not, or that they were fully present and then not, but that they were learning to be very strat savvy and strategic about how they were engaging in their spaces. And that's, you know, so Niobe actually observed and said, you know what, what you're observing is the first in a series of disconnections. And again, it's not like they're connected and then they're not, but that they're 
learning to kind of tone it down. They're learning to kind of watch themselves and they're learning like, you know, uh, what's possible, how it's possible for them to be boys, right? And, and so this shift starts kind of begins at early, early childhood. It, um, it kind of is a contrast to what infant studies have shown boys and all people actually are born with, which is a fundamental capacity and desire for close, mutual, responsive, emotionally intimate relationships. And it kind of moves to this and it reflects how they are actively reading and responding to their gender socialization. So again, messages about what it means to be a real boy, pressures to kind of not be too different, otherwise there will be consequences. And again, driven by this desire to connect. And what's kind of tragic or sad about that is that be, th their desire is to connect, but in doing the things that society tells them boys should do in order to be real boys, that actually makes it harder for them to develop the kinds of connections that they're seeking and that they're driven by or that they're motivated to, to, to develop. And so it actually leads them away from the authenticity that is, and the vulnerability, because of course vulnerability is also deemed feminine or gendered feminine. It leads them away from all the things that are most appealing to about them, all the things that are most likely to facilitate their connections to others. And then it leads them to this kind of death dilemma and sense of loneliness. So they could you know, be kind of um, passing as to use some sort of say, they're passing, they have a thousand Facebook friends, whatever, but they feel alone. They feel like nobody actually knows what they're like. And that is heartbreaking. And it is um, frustrating for them because they're like, hey, wait a minute, I did all the things I was supposed to do, but it didn't bring me the happiness and the success. And if, frankly, the further down the line, it can also contribute to you know, uh, challenges health-wise, mental and physical challenges. So anyway, I will stop there because like I said, I could talk on and on, but I just want to say like one of the questions Tavishi had brought up was kind of what are common responses to this work? And I think, you know, Hector brought up one of them, which is the zero mind, you know, zero, zero sum game mindset, which is like, oh, if we pay attention to boys, then we're ignoring girls. Or if we're choosing this group, then we're somehow not doing that. And, and, a, and a neglect to consider the fact, fact that when we, when, when we help a group, we're helping everybody because we're all interconnected on that level as well. And then, of course, always the the other kind of knee jerk response is you're feminizing boys, you're turning boys into men. And I always you know, try to emphasize that the, these their relational strengths are not feminine weaknesses. They are human strengths that are essential to their health and happiness down the line. And so when we lead them to cut themselves off from and devalue these things in themselves that we do them a huge disservice and we place them at greater, much, much greater risk. Um, and it's when they, when they you know, make a huge leap, when they cut themselves from their own, off from themselves, if they have to deny themselves what they feel, that makes it easier for them to objectify other people as well. Because the first objectification happens within the individual that then enables subsequent objectifications. So anyway, like I said, I, I will um, pause there. So interesting and it you know listening to you talk um, and listening to Joseph's talk has transported me back to my doctoral you know kind of days and we're th thinking about these things so deeply and just um really incredible and I let Damien I know Damien did you have your hand up I feel like I had you, you no okay well everybody's clapping uh for both of you I guess if, if you're okay with um just me kind of asking a question you know I think there is there's two questions, I guess, and one was for Joseph and one is for you, Judy, is that, you know, we in our GBI work, for instance, are looking at this age group of four to 13. And, you know, you're, I, of course, I know this from Niobe's work. I recently had a chance to speak to uh, uh, somebody at um, Overseas Development Institute who's doing this like line, nine year longitudinal study with um, adolescents, so between 14 and 19. And she is also noticing this global shift in, um, you know, kind of adolescents becoming, especially boys, beginning to kind of adhere to this, these very kind of rigid norms of masculinity and a huge shift around 16 um, is what she's noticing where they're suddenly kind of, uh, you know, becoming a, a man, right, essentially. And so, I mean, I think what's, I think just, and it's, a, it's not a question, but it's brainstorming is as we look at this age group of four to 13 in our GBI work, you know, how do we, and we're not even doing four to 13 in every single country. And that's also kind of split up in terms of these age groups. It's not the entire span. So, I mean, you know, it's a question of like, what are we going to find? And then what are the next steps in some ways? You know, is it, yeah, 
part of me was sort of thinking about we 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 would I would love to see what's happening you know across the the whole childhood right and so if there's a particular country where we're looking at eight to eleven or seven to eleven for instance in the UK I really do want to see what's happening. 12 to 16, but I don't know if we know enough from 7 to 11. So, you know, 8 to 11 or whatever. So I'm just, just that's one of the kind of thing, thoughts for us to, for me to think about and for, for, for you to sort of see if there's some comments around how do we begin to look at the age group and where do we, where is the potential for change, right? Where do we kind of come in and say, we're doing all this programming, this is change where we want to make it happen. And Joseph, a question for you in the end, I would be is, you know, you're talking about specificity which is hugely important, but a lot of the work that we end up doing is about scalability and sustainability. And we have all these questions about wanting to scale up things to you know, national level or even global level. And that's what kind of gets a lot of the money is, you know, we have, you know, which is there a parenting program that can be easily adapted? Of course, the, you know, adapted, but it's, it's scalable. And so there's this always this tension between how specific and how kind of what are the commonalities and the trends and things like that? So again, just things to think about and ask, um, but maybe we also, yeah, so I'll stop here and see if Judy, you had wanted to start with first and see if you had some ideas around the age. Oh, okay. So in terms of like the potential, I know that, um, well, you, we, we can, you can start with critical periods. And so again, early childhood has been identified as a critical period. Early adolescence is another critical period, you know, just in terms of cognitive shifts and also social changes and, and also physiological changes, um, particularly adolescence. And so that's one thing. And then if I can also just touch on like the idea of, um, you know, what to do next, I think one of the things is we've, we've known, and so it's kind of like evidence-based, right, that they seek, they seek connections and resist disconnections. So that's kind of the more, the universal truth. But absolutely for each population and community that you work with, you also wanna pay attention to what's particular for, you know, what's specific to them, what are their, their unique needs and, so, and adapting it in that way. And so always, you know, always be learning, always be collaborating with the leaders in those communities to make sure that again, we're not coming in with a, you know, one size fits all solution that may be, either not beneficial or perhaps even offensive to the ways that they, you know, their values and practices. And so always checking in. So the, again, going back to that voice-centered relational method is like, that's not just at the beginning where you're developing the theories and the ideas, but also through the construction of the interventions themselves. And that's very much, you know, kind of where the big question is in the field as well right now is kind of, we know what the problem is. We even know kind of on a broad level, what needs to happen, but how do we deliver this? And like you said, how do we scale it up? How do we make it? And how do we know like what's effective and why it's effective and really having conversations around that? Joseph? Sure, sure. What I can speak to actually to Vish is, is the project that we worked on when we were in Niobe's lab that looked at boys resistance and accommodation to norms of masculinity over a period of time. So we interviewed boys in sixth, ninth, and 11th grade about aspects of their lives where they resisted these norms of stereotypes or norms of masculinity. And then where are these moments in their life when they accommodated to these norms of masculinity? But part of that study was also trying to figure out what were the different settings or experiences in their lives that actually fostered their resistance. <laughs> so, you know, what were the sites of resistance on this developmental trajectory towards more adherence to these norms of masculinity? And I think within the context of schools, it was their relationships with their peers. You know, sometimes the relationships with their peers on the surface seemed like they were stereotypical in nature, but actually when, they, when you talk to them about their friendships, they use very emotional language, intimate language, language that, um, that you wouldn't anticipate boys um, would kind of talk about each other in certain kinds of ways. So their relationships with their peers, certain extracurricular activities, definitely like theater and drama as these sites of resistance for boys, advisory programs where there's a teacher leading the group talking to boys about their social lives and their experiences in the world became another setting of resistance for them. So, you know, it becomes where then if, if we've learned through looking at this trajectory of their resistance and accommodation to norms of masculinity in these particular grades, we do come out of that process learning where are their sites of resistance. 
and kind of figure out how can we um, shore up and bolster and emphasize um, those sites of resistance that then allow them to hold on to more of who they are as fundamentally human. So, you know, just being clear and clear about where those sites of resistance lie and how can we kind of support them and expand them and make sure that they're more prevalent in, in boys' lives. But then to your question about specificity, you know, it, it becomes looking at the specific experiences of particular racial ethnic groups of boys does allow us to, you know, it's from a grounded theory approach where we use narratives to then teach us about theory, <laughs> you know, so it becomes less about generalizing our insights to a population, but actually generalizing our insights back out to theory. So how does the specific experience of Latinx boys, Black boys, South Asian boys, Asian boys help us better understand who boys are? So the scale up question is, okay, maybe there's deeper dives in particular into, into particular racial ethnic groups. And then how do we, what, what we learned about their specific experiences can contribute to our ability to scale up <laughs> and, 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 you know, have something that can reach, you know, all boys, but still can be pivoted and adaptable in ways that can be responsive to the specific experiences of, of particular groups of boys, you know, but also being very clear that like, you know, Latinx boys or black boys need something different or unique. They are, they too are fundamentally human and need what all boys and children need, but their unique needs, however, are the result of historical, racial, and economic, and gender-based oppression. So just underscoring that point, because if then it just, if you don't, it contributes to these popular narratives around, you know, Black boys or Latinx boys being different, or inherently flawed, or something's wrong with them that, you know, that they're broken and need to be fixed. But in fact, they actually too are human, They've been entered and they entered a world that harms them in particular kinds of ways that have led to them having a specific kind of experience that we want to be aware of, but then at the same time, scale up so that it can be something that's supportive of all boys, but pivoted and adapted in ways that meet the specific needs of particular groups. Super helpful. Thank you. There's a question in the chat um, from Clara. Uh, for Judy first, um, Judy, how do we support boys who stand up to the principles they believe in? So calling out sexism, racism, xenophobia, transphobia, and be true to who they are. So being compassionate, caring, tender, and connected. When the people, peers, or teachers they're trying to connect with ridiculize, ridiculize them for that. So how do we support them? No, I think that's such a good question. Um, First of all, you know, I always say we start with listening and we want to validate what they've observed, you know, and so say, yes, absolutely, I see this too, or I I I I, I confirm that they're seeing what they're seeing, right? And then and but then also don't be too quick to try to fix it because it's not an easy fix because our society is complicated and unfortunately there's some problems that aren't don't just go away by that. But so so just really, I mean making again making space for them to have those questions valuing those questions and saying this you know this is something that even adults struggle with and so it is a hard question and and, and you know depending on their age kind of gradually you know helping them to see like well what where where can we help you know in what ways can we help what do you think you know what do you think would be helpful when this is happening what would make you feel better or the person that you've observed experiencing this or you know how how can you make it better? so uh, again just kind of um helping where I, I tend to think small <laughs> because i tend to focus on individuals but i'm always like you know if the individuals can feel like they're okay and if they can extend to their immediate you know their immediate relationships then we start to change the social norms in that way too and so um but i know that's not a very satisfying answer and clara i'm happy to email me any of you female they email me and i'm happy to have conversations because i also know that everyone has places to be but i also just want to you know give props to what, what joseph was pointing out because i think it's such an important point that you know listening to more people helps you reach more people you know and that was really where carol's work came in as well like she said all of these models of human development psychology were really based on a specific group of men right and what happens if we listen to girls and women and what happened was it didn't 
you know, it changed the conversation, not just about girls and women, but about all people, because it brought to light things that hadn't come up when they only studied one specific narrow group. And so the more that we listen to, you know, diverse groups and hear about different people's experiences, the more we all have be a better understanding of the way that the human condition can play out and manifest. And then we all have more access to the options that various people are employing to survive or hopefully thrive within the, you know, within this reality that we all kind of share to varying degrees. So anyway super helpful um i know people are having to uh, hop off but clara clara had a uh, just again a quest, not a question but a request that you know joseph and judy if you could recommend any work on promoting the sites of resistance essentially so one would be niobe's book crisis of connection for sure um but if there's other pieces that you feel um you would be able to share please please do um, but I, yeah, I mean, I think anybody else, I'll take a second. Um, email me if you're, I actually spoke with, met with Carol in New York last month, and she sent me a talk that she just gave in Texas about resistance that kind of summarizes the last 40 years of her work. So, and it's 12 pages, a double space. So, and she gave me permission to share it. So if you would like a copy of that, email me and I'm happy to share it because I think it's brilliant. And she's come to this level of clarity about her work that she's very excited about. So I don't mean to keep promoting her, but everything I do is based on what she did, you know, what she made possible and on the shoulder on her shoulders for sure. And so um, let me know if you'd like to see that. And it's, it's yeah. it happens to focus on the girls, but it's very much relevant to the boys stuff too. I think, yeah, Judy, I'll, I'll, if you send it to me and, or you can just send it to the Promundo USA, um, you know, group. And so it'll just go to the staff if that's okay. Uh, the staff. Okay. Yes. Oh, see, every, uh, and the board <laughs> who are all saying <laughs> yes, please. So, yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, you know, I think we are very lucky, uh, both of you for, for having, um, you all, both on, on our board, but also bringing such thoughtful, kind of insights and kind of, you know, just your own kind of personal self to, to this conversation today. I think, um, you know, I know for a fact that I have been very lucky knowing you all, but, um, and then, you know, it's just such a pleasure to see you, uh, both your work, the trajectory. Um, and yeah, I, I really feel transported back to the space and days where we could talk about, you know, theory and data and um, come up with ideas together. So, a big thank you again, and I will I'll share this recording with everybody. And um, yeah, thank you both so much, and have a lovely day, everybody. Thank you all for being here. You too, you too. Thank you, Tavishi. Thank you, Judy, Joseph. A treat, Very the well, highlight of you, my thank day. You. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Bye. Joseph and Judy, I'm gonna keep this.